Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will be joined by long-term Dataversity friend Tony Saris to discuss a data governance framework for smart data. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right for that in the corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Bob Seiner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration Newsletter, TDAN.com. Bob has been the recipient of the DAMA Professional Award for significant and demonstrable contributions to the data management industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to introduce his guest speaker for today and, today's, and get today's webinar started. Bob, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending uh, this month's installment of the Real World Data Governance Series. As Shannon mentioned, the name of this, series, this uh, installment is a data governance framework for smart data. And smart data seems to be one of those hot new topics that everybody seems to be talking about. I'm getting a lot of questions about it. Whenever the term smart data is being used, uh, people have questions as to what makes data smart. Um, and, you know, I, I decided, uh, we decided when we put the series together that we would have special guests from time to time. And as Shannon mentioned, a, a good friend of Dataversity and a new good friend of mine, uh, Tony Saris from N2 Semantics is a smart data guru, specialist, somebody who's going to help us to really understand what smart data is, how it relates to data governance, and what is going to be necessary in order to put a data governance framework in place for smart data. So thank you very much for attending the session today. Glad to have you with us as always. Before I get started and before I introduce Tony, uh, I just want to share a couple of items of note with you. Uh, the, the webinar that will be part of this series next month is do-it-yourself and purchased data governance tools. And if you've been attending my webinars in the past, you know that I spend a lot of time sharing tools and templates and things that I've used over the years uh, with practitioners and clients to help them to establish their data governance programs. I look forward to sharing with you in a lot of detail uh, more information about the do-it-yourself data governance tools, and also some tools that you can purchase on the market. So please uh, register online for the next month's webinar. I'll be looking forward to having you there. A couple other quick items of note, if you're not familiar yet with the fact that I put together a book called Non-Invasive Data Governance, there's information on the screen that will help you to locate that book if you are interested. Um, also, kikconsulting.com, that is my website, and that is the home of non-invasive data governance. I wanted to share with you a, a Dataversity event that I will be speaking at shortly, and actually there's another one that's not even listed on there, but the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference taking place at the end of June and the beginning of July. I will be giving two presentations. One is a tutorial on assessing your existing data governance program, and then we're also going to talk about data governance, privacy, and the Internet of Things. Um, later in the year, this fall, there's a Data Governance Finance Conference as well. You can learn more about that on the Dataversity site, and I will be also giving a presentation at that conference in Jersey City. Last but not least, if you're not familiar with the Data Administration Newsletter, tdan.com, as Shannon has mentioned, it's a publication that I've had since 1997. It touches on all issues that are related, or as many as I can, related to data and data management in industry these days. Um, so this monthly issue, the May issue, is, is already available, and there just so happens to be an article from my special guest today. Tony Saris provided an article called Bots in a Smart Data World. So if you're interested in learning about bots for a smart data world, please, uh, please take a look at the newsletter uh, and uh, register online for newsletter updates from time to time, or should I say monthly, as well. 
So now that we've gotten that stuff out of the way, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the abstract that we use for today's session. You know, first question that I have for you is, does your organization have something that they call smart data? You know, how is your organization going about defining smart data? Tony, in a couple minutes here, is going to share with us an excellent definition of what smart data is and why um, why you can, uh, why you should be paying attention to smart data and why that really is the wave of the future. Smart data is data used in non-traditional ways, as mentioned on, this, on the screen here. Um, businesses are embracing big data. They're talking about putting big data governance in place. Now that they're starting to uh, extend that to include smart data, um, we're expecting that there will be needs for smart data governance as well. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about putting a, a framework in place, or at least pieces of a framework in place, to govern your smart data. Um, and so some of the things that we're going to talk about today is, is Tony's going to provide here in a second an easy to understand definition of smart data, why you should provide a framework to govern that, how smart data differs from traditional sources of data, and how smart data can and you will be used in the future. And, and to last but not least, I'm going to share with you a couple of the items that I believe go into creating a framework around governing your smart data. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my special guest for today. Hi, Tony. Hi, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's good to have you here. Um, and glad to know that you work very closely with Dataversity from our conversations prior to this webinar. Um, Tony has, has really provided me with a lot of insight into what smart data is, and I know that I'm getting questions about it, if not daily, it's certainly weekly, about what smart data is. Tony is the founder and principal of N2 Semantics, a consultancy based out of Orange County, California, and he specializes in semantic technologies, artificial intelligence, and cognitive computing. Tony, is there anything else that you want people to know about you before we get started with the webinar? Well, uh, you were uh, kind enough or crazy enough to put my profile picture up there. So as you can see, uh, it's my hair is kind of salt and pepper, a little more on the salt side these days. So I've been at the, the, uh, the, the field of data management, uh, uh, data modeling, database administration for a number of years. Uh, people always ask me how I got into artificial intelligence uh, since I started off more in traditional data management. And uh, so I thought I'd mention that uh, I was working in the early and mid-1990s uh, in database integration. That was the time everybody started connecting their, their databases. And of course, they found out immediately that the conceptual definitions they had for a lot of the entities and data elements in those various databases, uh, when they were talking about the same or similar uh, entities or data elements, turned out to be different, sometimes in big ways, sometimes in subtle ways. Uh, so we started exploring the use of metadata, conceptual schemas, to be able to define what those uh, data entities and data elements really meant uh, you know, in, a, in a sort of formalized way. Uh, that got me into the field of ontology or knowledge representation. Uh, I spent a number of years uh, working with uh, metadata for uh, development uh, repositories, so uh, component-based development and web services. I uh, eventually got into uh, things around the semantic web, so uh, uh, things involving RDF and the OWL um, uh, ontology for expressing uh, semantics in an RDF context. Uh, more recently, I've done work in uh, machine learning uh, aspects of uh, data analytics and uh, also cognitive computing, so exploring things like intelligent uh, assistant technologies uh, and other sort of smart applications that use the kinds of smart data that we're talking about today. So I think this is great timing for uh, talking about uh, a data governance framework for smart data. Uh, smart data and intelligent systems in general are exploding right now on the scene, and, and I think the, 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 the oftentimes the people working in that field uh, may not have the traditional data governance background, and so I think the, the, the notion of how we uh, manage and govern the data associated with those systems uh, hasn't been explored maybe as fully as it should be, so I think it's time we... Uh, we really tackle those questions. And it's great. You know, I think you're the ideal person to have as my special guest on this webinar because you've got a lot to say, a lot of experience, and it's great that you have 
kind of that traditional data management background uh, to get started, and certainly metadata is, is big in all aspects of data governance and all aspects of data management. So in a second, I'm gonna ask you to provide a, a definition of what exactly we mean by smart data. Before we do that, though, I'm gonna start with uh, sharing the, the, the few definitions that I typically share at the beginning of this webinar series, and that's my definitions of data governance, data stewardship, and non-invasive data governance. So the, the term that I use, or the definition that I use for data governance is that it is the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data-related resources. And I've heard lots of definitions for data governance, but I like my definition to have some teeth behind it, because the truth is, no matter what approach you take to governing data, whether it's smart data or big data or master data or metadata or just your traditional business data, there is a need at the end of the day to be able to execute and enforce authority over the management of that data. So we're certainly going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go into precisely what we mean by smart data. Data stewardship, on the other hand, is, uh, is what I consider to be the formalization of accountability for pe from people over the management of data and data-related resources. There are people within organizations that have levels of responsibility for the data, including smart data, and then the, the, the up-and-coming field of smart data and the big data field that's with us uh, and has been with us for several years. But really what we're talking about is formalizing accountability rather than handing accountability to people as something that's brand new to them. So typically when I talk about non-invasive data governance, really non-invasive really describes how governance is applied so that we can govern data in a non-threatening manner in ways that are going to fit well into the culture of the organization. And the goal of being non-invasive in the approach to governance is to be transparent, supportive, and collaborative. So with that, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you, Tony, here for, for a couple minutes uh, to start to provide us uh, a good definition of, um, you know, what the heck is smart data and what makes data smart. So please, uh, please take the floor and, and explain to the listeners what smart data is. Well, I think uh, probably one of the first questions people have is, uh, is, is smart data just another name for big data? And I think uh, the, the two are closely related, but uh, they're not the same thing. Uh, I view big data really in a way as smart data in raw form. So it's the, the, the data that gets uh, analyzed and, and uh, semantics get extracted from that data, meaning, relationships, those sort of things, and that turns it into smart data. And, and as big data gets used by smart systems, uh, uh, those systems uh, add additional uh, metadata or other uh, aspects of meaning around that big data that, that again, pulls it into this realm of smart data. Um, I think one thing certainly about uh, smart data is that it's uh, self-describing through metadata. Uh, so that's partly where it gets its smarts and certainly it has the sort of traditional administrative metadata that you would expect. Uh, any uh, uh, data to have, but it also has other metadata that really uh, provides the, the meaning associated uh, with it. And that meaning often uh, comes from understanding sort of the context of the data. And some aspects of context are things that, that you know, we've tracked with metadata for a while, uh, the source of the data, maybe who uses it, the location, the time, but we're going much deeper into that, and we're, we're uh, collecting large sets of, of metadata about the data and then doing deeper analysis of it. So, you know, we may look at, uh, at the location in comparison with the time, in comparison with the usage by particular apps, uh, one app and then, you know, another app that might pick up the data and follow on and extend it and expand it. So we're getting sort of much deeper and richer and, and more uh, complex in a lot of ways, views of how that data is being used uh, and new data that's being created from intelligent systems. And the data can be, you know, sort of uh, about uh, domain itself and it can be about the users that are, that are actually consuming that data. So if you think about smart data in the context of maybe a retail system, uh, we collect a lot of data about how people, uh, you know, their historical buying patterns and their interests, uh, the sites they go to, uh, how often uh, they clicked on something to buy and what was the, 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 the uh, maybe call to action that drove them to, to click to buy. And so we're collecting all this analysis about user behavior in addition to just the sort of pure data about the, the activity that the user's doing. And all of that then is now, you know, being analyzed 
uh, to produce sort of much more of a bigger picture of view of, uh, of uh, the world that we live in and provide a lot more sort of meaning about that world uh, in various domains. And I'll talk about those domains in a minute. Um, you know, the, the data gets additional meaning. Uh, some of it is uh, explicitly described. Uh, some of it is, uh, is annotated by humans. So you can pull in, for example, an ontology, maybe a linked open data model from the semantic web world or some other uh, model, domain model that can augment or provide meaning to, uh, to big data. Uh, you could do something like uh, tag it, uh, as often done in the, in the semantic web world. You could uh, introduce some structure with something like a schema.org annotation. Uh, so, you know, there's a way that humans do that very deliberately, but I think probably more frequently today what we're seeing is uh, actually inducing uh, the meaning uh, related to the data or patterns and relationships about the data through running statistical and other sort of data analytics processes against that. So, you know, the whole uh, set of things that we, uh, we call machine learning and all the algorithms that we're applying to that big data now uh, that really provides the smarts behind it. In addition to that, we've got uh, 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 data that's actually generated by the machine. So in a lot of cases, we're, we're reporting on the data, or we're doing sort of prescriptive things about the data, maybe question and answer. But uh, oftentimes now with smart systems, we're moving beyond that into things like uh, predictive analytics. So this is, you know, uh, data that was actually created by the system, maybe based on data that it already had about trends, but now it's going to step beyond that and really uh, giving us sort of uh, an idea of what might be or simulating certain things. So machine-generated data. Uh, cognitive computing types of systems uh, inherently sort of feed on themselves in a positive way. So there's a lot of feedback and learning. Uh, they look at which things uh, are successful. Maybe they uh, make a prediction and, and based on the, the success or failure of that prediction in the, in the real world. Uh, they, they learn from that, and, and so that sort, of, that sort of layering that they do about which things are working and not working, which things people like and, and, and dislike, uh, all goes into sort of building up this additional set of metadata that provides smarts around the data. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I noticed in your definitions of what smart data is is that you use a lot of the terms that people from traditional data management backgrounds are very well familiar with when you talk about metadata and you talk about analytics and you talk about patterns and things like that. You know, it's good to have a, a data management background in order to get a better understanding of what smart data is. Are you finding that um, that a large percentage of organizations or a small percentage of organizations are embracing smart data, calling it smart data. What are you seeing in the industry as it pertains to smart data? I, I think initially, particularly as we moved into uh, data analytics and machine learning, that uh, a lot of the data scientists in that field weren't necessarily familiar with uh, traditional data management. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes, they would run these algorithms and identify patterns, and they wouldn't, uh, and they would use the patterns subsequently in smart applications, uh, like prediction and that sort of thing. But they wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, think of persisting that data and, and creating a model of it and managing it and doing all the things that those of us who come from a, a more traditional uh, database management background uh, would, would sort of naturally think of doing. So I am seeing now, probably within even as recently as maybe the last year or so. Uh, people in the data science community uh, being beginning to get a lot more uh, sensitive to and, and rigorous about uh, the, the whole aspect of data management and looking at the, the terms that have been used in more traditional uh, uh, data management forums, whether that's uh, databases or, or other uh, ways of managing data, the SORI and that sort of thing, and, and beginning to pull some of that into uh, to their work as well. Yeah, and, and you know what, it, it's interesting because we as, as data governance practitioners, or at least those of us that are data governance practitioners, are looking, for, are always looking for new and innovative ways to be able to apply governance to the data that our organizations use. So it makes sense, um, but it's great to have smart data people or smart data, the people that are focused on smart data, kind of learning more about data management skills and data management people learning more about what smart data is. Um, you know, 
when we talk about data governance, and there's so many different types of data governance, and people give different labels to data governance. You know, you hear about things called big data governance and master data governance and, and now smart data governance. Well, you know, there's a lot of differences in the, the types of data that are being used. So are there things that we can learn from what we're doing around governing big data and unstructured data and those types of things um, from a metadata perspective, from how the data is defined, as you mentioned earlier, and produced, and it's used in organizations. I, I would assume then that there are ways that we can use what we've learned from governing, I won't call it dumb data, but data that's not yet considered smart data. You see uh, that there's room for governance of the smart data as organizations start to embrace the idea of smart data. Yeah, and I, and I agree with you. I don't think of it as dumb data. I think it's data that has semantics inherent in it that sometimes hasn't been teased out, right? So what we're doing now is sort of releasing that or, or getting that additional information. So I do think there's a lot of tie-ins between the two. I think uh, the, a, a big data governance framework uh, can be extended into smart data based on the sort of processes that you're doing against that data. and, and uh, and so I think, and the same thing as you mentioned with, uh, you know, concepts of metadata and using metadata to manage that, I think is, is directly germane to the, the world of smart data as well. It may be different metadata. We may be adding additional metadata we didn't have before, and some of them were uh, uh, reapplying existing metadata in a, in a somewhat different context. I think really for, I'm really glad uh, to hear you say that. Oh, I'm really glad to hear you say that. I mean, there's a lot of organizations that think that they need to put big data governance as something different or master data governance as being something different. And it really, uh, I mean, what I'm finding now is that organizations that, are, that I have had contact with that are embracing smart data and smart data applications, that they're looking to be able to apply existing levels of governance that are taking place within their organization. So, you know, one of the next questions I'd like to ask you is, you gave us a really solid definition of what smart data is. Um, please share with the listeners of the webinar uh, and with me and with Shannon, you know, what are some of the applications that organizations or how are organizations applying smart data um, for use within their organization? And then maybe share a little bit about how these uses might have a need for that data to be governed just the way, the same way that we govern other data in the organization. I've listed several that you've shared with me as to being applications. If you could kind of walk through those and share a little bit more detail about those, I'd appreciate it. Well, I, I think you're right that the, the usage of the data in uh, particular ways, in particular applications, does uh, inform or, or drive the, the requirements for data governance. And uh, the, the ones that you, you see there uh, that we spoke about, uh, when we talked before, are sort of ordered from maybe least intelligent to most intelligent, and, and starting with uh, thinking of adding uh, semantics to our existing search and filtering capabilities that we've had in, with things like you know Google or, or Bing, right, and other uh, enterprise kinds of search tools. So now we're searching by concepts. Uh, so we've introduced a, a little bit of smartness by uh, by now using concepts. And so you know the Google Knowledge Graph uh, that's uh, Underneath their Hummingbird algorithm is an example of that, and, and many enterprise uh, content management systems and search tools now are beginning to introduce uh, a sort of uh, semantic graph or semantic model um, in the background underneath their search engines that helps to do that intelligent search and filtering. And so, you know, we need to govern the, the, the concepts that exist uh, in those uh, uh, models that, are, that they're using underneath and understand, uh, you know, how that, those are being applied uh, in, in search and filtering. Uh, the next level, sort of building on that, is uh, what, what I've characterized as intelligent content discovery. So uh, cases where maybe you give a set of criteria to a system, an intelligent system, and it goes off and does automated research on your behalf. Uh, or what's probably more common experience for people uh, is personalized news feeds. So uh, you tell a, uh, a, a intelligent content uh, assistant uh, things that you're interested in, or point it to uh, uh, you know a particular article that you like, uh, and it gets a sense of, of what your what your uh, likes are, and uh, presents you with uh, with news items that correspond to those likes or interests. Uh, and a company I've worked with for quite a while, Primal, uh, is uh, is very big in that arena, and is a good example of that kind of using. Uh, intelligence about uh, both the domain that you're interested in, 
on the nature of it and your interest in combining those two to do things like personalized news feeds. Um, question and answer systems is another big one. So uh, being able to respond to questions that people have, particularly in a domain like customer support, that's probably one of the big application areas of Q&A systems uh, to uh, basically be able to take um, you know, the knowledge that we have about products and, and be able to use it in a customer support context. But health advice is another big uh, Q&A type application. Uh, image and object identification systems are, are very big right now in a lot of different uh, markets, and I'll talk about markets in a minute. But knowing, you know, who's in an image, what's in an image, what are they doing, uh, that kind of stuff. And you can imagine then, you know, tagging the images with that kind of information and be able to make use of it uh, for search and other, other purposes. Um, then we begin to get into, you know, a different aspect of intelligence around sort of maybe emotions. So sentiment analysis uh, is very big right now, you know, understanding how your customers view your product or your brand and the perceptions that they may be expressing about it in social media. So all the data that's associated with that, how do we manage that, how do we collect that, manage it, uh, and use it. Trend analysis sort of takes that to the next level too, looking at, you know, maybe product purchases, uh, historical sorts of things. Uh, political issues or one to kind of understand what current trends are. And then moving into the world of, you know, uh, of, of recommendations and predictions and, you know, becoming active with that data. So recommendation systems in their simplest forms, things like, uh, you know, what, what we use every day in a product like Amazon, for example, and their product uh, recommendation or Netflix and movie recommendations. But I'm seeing a lot of uh, work in, in that uh, in the area of jobs. So if you're job hunting, you know, uh, looking at your skills and your resume and being able to match that to, uh, to open jobs. Or the other thing I find interesting is in employers who are job uh, are looking for employees and they want to find people who are uh, passive, who aren't necessarily out looking for jobs right now. And so they're using uh, tools to analyze the web for things like, um, you know, what's an artifact you've produced? Maybe you've checked in code on GitHub. Maybe you've written a blog. Maybe you've done things like that that create a presence, and they're using that then to analyze uh, and do matching of, uh, of candidates to open job recs that they have. Uh, decision support systems become even smarter then, things like evaluating customers for loans or uh, looking at the risk around insurance. Uh, you know, healthcare certainly is very big for decision support, uh, whether we're talking about uh, diagnosing. Uh, conditions or coming up with mitigations for things uh, like chronic care, coming up with chronic care plans. Uh, so decision support tools uh, are used uh, heavily there. IBM, you know, famously with their work in Watson is very heavy into that market. Um, moving even further, simulations. So, you know, chat bots that, that seem like you're interacting with a human in a context like maybe customer support or even just in a fun kind of entertainment context. And, uh, and I'm really surprised I have a teenage son who's a big gamer, and the uh, non-player characters in games are getting very sophisticated, and they sort of learn based on, uh, on playing with humans, uh, and, and they become smarter and, and more challenging over time, uh, picking up sort of the strategies that humans use when they're playing these games. And then last is really, you know, full predictions, whether you're talking about elections or stocks or uh, people's purchases, using all of that information we've collected to be able to uh, sort of intelligently uh, uh, make, uh, uh, you know, predictions about uh, where things are headed, uh, you know, based on, on existing data, but really showing some intelligence in the systems themselves in terms of how they might, you know, move beyond sort of obvious predictions. Yep. And so, you know, I can see what you meant by as you go through the list of bullets of the applications of smart data, they go from, you know, at the bottom of the list there are things that we're more traditionally aware of, you know, from decision support and data warehousing and business intelligence and those types of things, you know, simulations and predictions. Those are things that organizations have been taking a look at doing and have been doing, you know, have been doing longer than some of the things that are at the top of the list. And it, it seems to make sense that, you know, these, da these data sources, the data is coming from different places. It's being used in different ways. It's being used in innovative ways to be able to really assist in, in managing customers. Um, are you seeing those organizations that are, are applying the smart data, that they're focusing on the governance of the smart data, or is that something that there's still a significant amount of room for improvement in, in these organizations? 
Well, I think, as you said, I think for the ones that are more, let's say, sort of incremental or evolutionary steps from what we've been doing currently, I think they are. I think in the ones that are newer, I think a lot of what's going on in the enterprise right now is very much uh, sort of uh, sticking their toe in the water. So pilot uh, uh, applications and, and maybe even uh, just exploring these technologies and, and trying to get a sense of where they might have applicability for the business. So I'm not sure in those cases that they've really explored yet, uh, you know, what the ramifications might be on, on data governance. And I do think it varies by market. Some markets are more are further along than others. And I mentioned customer care before. I think uh, uh, customer support, uh, that's, that's an area that is fairly far along, um, in large part because uh, we, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, you have a lot of product information, you have a lot of facts, uh, you have a, uh, a lot of information about how to, to care for and maintain a product. But it's been sort of flipped into this notion now of, of uh, responding to questions that users may have, so knowledge-centered support. And we've restructured that data, um, and so we're able to answer questions that people have in an automated way by chatting with the bot or uh, by them just sort of querying uh, uh, knowledge-centered databases more directly. Uh, so it's a very good fit for this sort of thing. And there's a learning and feedback loop in there, too, based on, on how people uh, interact with those systems, they become smarter, they understand the kinds of questions that people ask them and the ways that they ask them. So all of that metadata that gets built up about the interaction of users with those systems becomes very valuable to improve those systems. Uh, healthcare is another area that I mentioned that's, oh, you had a question, Bob? No, I'll just say, uh, go ahead, go continue through the applications. I think that's okay. great. Yeah. So, Okay, so healthcare is another one, uh, you know, even more data uh, than, than uh, in, in customer support, I think it's exploding. Personalized healthcare, everything from, you know, Fitbit or uh, wearable kinds of things to uh, people, you know, sharing much more about their health information in a formal way. And obviously there's, uh, you know, there's privacy, security, and other concerns in that domain probably uh, to a much higher degree than there is in almost any other domain that we're working with. So the data governance aspects there I think have a pretty uh, high threshold. Whether you're talking about sort of individual data, so you know personally identifiable information, or you're talking about aggregate data, and one of the issues that I that I uh, see a lot of discussion about in the in the smart data community is um, you know this notion of of uh, particularly in healthcare, aggregate data is very valuable. But can we analyze aggregate? Can we share and analyze aggregate data without? risking exposing people's individual data. And, you know, famously, I think it was even in the late 90s when, uh, when uh, Massachusetts uh, introduced their uh, equivalent of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act when they introduced their state health plan, um, William Wells, who was governor at the time, you know, uh, famously said, uh, you know, we can share all this data and analyze it in, and protect people's uh, privacy. And, of course, a grad student was easily able to take the publicly shared data from the health plan and correlate that to other publicly available data about people and, and came up with, was able to get to William Welch's individual health care data and his prescriptions and whatever and, and so, sort of prove that, that there was a fairly high threshold to, uh, to be able to protect that data. And I think if you think that was the late 90s and where we are today with algorithms that we have to process those data sets and the, the explosion in healthcare-related data sets, the bar is even higher for what we need to do to be able to, to protect that data when we anonymize it. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in the field called uh, differential privacy uh, that data scientists are, are focused on where they very uh, scientifically algorithmically introduce noise into data sets, and they do that in such a way uh, that it doesn't statistically alter the, the value of the data set, but it makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for people to use sophisticated algorithms to reverse engineer to get to individual data. So I think you, you see, you know, people cognizant of that in the, in the, in the smart data community and, and trying to apply, you know, advanced tools like uh, differential privacy for that, that purpose. Uh, education is another big area, very personalized. Again, uh, particularly K through 12, there's a lot of sensitivity around uh, the data that's collected around individual learners. But there's, again, a lot of value in, in aggregate uh, uh, analysis of that data and understanding how to, to tune uh, curricula 
Um, you know, again, feedback uh, is, is very key, so collecting lots of data about how people are learning is, is uh, very valuable in that particular market area. Retail, you know, everybody knows sort of the analytics in the retail side, uh, you know, and the issues around privacy uh, in that context, and pay, payments, electronic payment system, certainly lots of data governance issues. I think as we move into the sort of unexplored part where people now begin to bridge between the virtual uh, retail world and the physical brick and mortar world, um, uh, that I think it's going to open up even additional, you know, privacy concerns and, and uh, concerns about the kinds of data that we're collecting about people. Um, Travel, leisure, and entertainment systems, I think mostly kind of fun things, and I think people have less uh, concern about that if you're, if you're uh, collecting data about people's maybe movie habits or whatever, and if you're making uh, uh, predictions or, or recommendations about that, you can maybe afford to be wrong a little bit more often. Maybe the quality thresholds are a little bit less, but it's so important to give people a good experience that, you know, you collect the right data and you understand what they're interested in and offer them, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the content that they're interested in. And of course, if they move to a buy service scenario, we bring into play, again, all of the things around uh, security there. Um, intelligent virtual personal assistants and bots. Uh, you mentioned the article that I, uh, that I wrote uh, that you were kind enough to publish in your newsletter. And so that's a hot topic right now. I think bots are, are uh, you know, sort of very, specialized sorts of assistance, uh, but, uh, and people are less concerned maybe about uh, a single point bot, but as you think of these intelligent personal, virtual personal assistants like Siri, Cortana, uh, Google Now, or their new Google Assistant they just announced, um, you're going much more horizontally and you're crossing a lot of different domains. These are things that people could, could basically use in almost every aspect of their personal life as they're out and about in the real world, and so they're going to have access to just uh, incredible amounts of data about people uh, and their habits, uh, you know. And so I think uh, there's a, there's a whole uh, world of, of data governance and data management issues that need to be sorted out there. And similarly with smart home, you know, we're moving from the kind of more sensor-based things with your Nest thermostat or your lighting system or whatever, maybe even your home security system. And certainly there's issues with not wanting to have those hacked. Um, but I think uh, as we tie the smart home with things like Amazon Echo and Google just announced their uh, competitor product uh, yesterday, I think, to that, uh, you're going to, again, tie in entertainment, retail, healthcare. Uh, these sort of smart homes will have uh, just incredible amounts of data about families and the, 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 the life that they're living in the home, moving even to their car as they go out into the world. And there's sorts of, sorts of issues in terms of, you know, uh, hacking into cars and getting control of autonomous vehicles or driver-assisted vehicles. And so, you know, you can imagine this space is, is, uh, is just exploding. And uh, so there's, a, there's definitely uh, 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 a lot of demand for uh, data governance uh, to sort of help in the security, privacy, and just control of all the data that's being created, making sure that it's accessible, that people know what the data is and they know, you know, how and where to use it. Yeah, and I would guess that most of the people that are attending this webinar can find themselves in one of the industries that you just mentioned. And, you know, we've, we're kind of moving beyond traditional uses of data and traditional ways of being able to collect data. And it's, it's a scary world out there for a lot of people that the data that's, be, that's coming from sensors and coming from devices and coming from your smart home and all those types of things, that we prevent them from being hackable. We protect that data because it really tells people a lot of information about, about us and about our businesses and, and those types Types of things. So, so typically, you know, I talk about data governance in terms of you know making sure that we define data well. And it sounds as though in the uh, in the smart data space that that the data is being defined pretty well. But the way that it's being produced and who has access to it and who can use it certainly is calling for needs to take our traditional ways of governing data and extend it in, 
into some of these new markets and these new applications. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what are some of the opportunity areas for smart data as we move forward? And then I threw a couple questions down on the bottom uh, right-hand side of the screen. You know, what is the need for governance of these types of data? And you know, do they need to be specially um, pulled out or, or set apart from the other types of data that we're governing? And you know, how will data governance assist the organization to be able to address some of these opportunities. So if you could first speak to the opportunities, and then, well, why is there a need to govern that data just like we govern any other data that we have in our organization? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, people probably got a sense, as I was saying, about the applications and the, the markets of the kinds of, of issues that, that are implicit in, uh, in uh, introducing those applications in, in, uh, the, in the particular markets. And it does vary by application and by market, but I think you know, we're seeing certainly uh, user profiles getting much richer, much more advanced demographic data, psychometric data, behavioral data, all the contextual stuff about where people are, what times they're at particular things, uh, the, the, work, the, the flow that they go through, you know, their, their daily habits, uh, where they drive, uh, what they eat, all this kind of information is being collected and, and uh, or could be collected and, you know, getting the sense of, of how to manage that and, and, and share it where it makes sense and where people are comfortable and give their authorization for it to be shared uh, to make sure that we're able to use that data in, in uh, ways that are adding value to people. So that's the obvious thing. I think probably less obvious uh, to people outside of the data science community uh, is this notion of, of bias uh, in the data sets, and particularly if we're looking at machine learning algorithms, uh, which are so uh, pervasive and predominant today in, in artificial intelligence, uh, you've got the data set that is used to train models. So a data scientist picks various data sets that they want to, to train the models with. Those data sets may have been, uh, you know, sort of curated by them, or they may have been produced by a third party, in which case that third party may have had a particular view when they were creating the data set. And so the person uh, using it, the data scientist using it for the model training needs to understand that and, you know, have, a, have a, the same view about that data or at least a good understanding of it. So they're selecting the data sets that train the model and that sort of is based on their viewpoint again and they're, they're putting then uh, the potential for, for bias in the resulting model that's produced by doing uh, that analytics process or that machine learning process. Uh, and that resides in the model and may not be obvious to people who are using the model. Uh, and several companies that, uh, you know, offer access to, to various algorithms via APIs and a <clears throat> software as a services perspective, um, you know, they, they don't necessarily sort of publish a lot of details about the data that they use to train the model. So, you know, you, know, you have to go with their reputation of, of do you believe that they did a thorough job of training the model and is that model applicable to use for particular analyses of targeted data that you want to run uh, against that model? So then you're choosing as the user of the model your target data and you want to make sure that that target data matches the model well. Are you applying uh, the model to a set of data that you should be applying it to? If you have a mismatch, you could get misleading results. So you need to uh, sort of understand all of that. So I think provenance, if I want to use a keyword there, of the training sets, of the models themselves, of the target data, understanding that, having it be transparent, and making informed decisions about it is uh, extremely uh, critical as we move into smart data. And, you know, I think one of the problems is that the biases can be hidden. Sometimes they only come out in the results. And, you know, they're biases that may have been introduced completely unintentionally. And probably the most famous uh, example of that is last summer, uh, Google made available their um, uh, image recognition algorithm, and a uh, uh, an African American uh, a couple or friends, I guess they were, uh, uh, male and female, had a selfie that they'd taken, sort of in a field somewhere or a park or whatever, and they put it out there and used Google's tool to analyze it. And Google tagged them, tagged the the, the photo as being a picture of gorillas, an extremely offensive, embarrassing incident. Uh, that hit social media and Google was immediately apologetic for, but it exposed, you know, bias that's in models that I'm sure was unintentional on Google's part. And, and Google didn't uh, acknowledge necessarily the, uh, the details of what went wrong in that case, what went horribly wrong, 
Uh, but I think a lot of people who were analyzing it suspected at least that you know Google had trained the the uh, model with uh, various settings, outdoors, indoors, uh, various uh, objects, uh, animals, people. But in the people that they trained it with, they may well have only used a small subset of white people. And so here you've got African American people in an outdoor setting, uh, and the dark skin alone may have been enough in the pattern recognition to somehow rather match that to gorillas as opposed to humans with darker skin tone. So, you know, there are going to be a lot of cases like this unless people are very cognizant of the, the data sets, the algorithms, and the data, target data that they're applying with those models. So I think, you know, if I look at it as, oh, go ahead. You have a question about that? I was going to say, how, how will the governance of the data help to prevent or expose some of those biases? Because that's one of the things that I find most fascinating about this screen right here, or this uh, this slide right here, is that when you talk about biases in data sets and biases may be hidden, you know, is, will data governance and the role and the, the role that data governance plays within the organization, will it help to resolve some of these issues? You know, because people are looking at the results, um, but they don't necessarily understand the biases. Will it become governance's responsibility to make sure that as these results are being made public, that um, that they're basically transparent in you know what the what the biases that are used to make these decisions will governance play a role in that? Well, I, I think you're uh, famous, famous uh, for saying uh, accountability for the data is based on uh, your relationship with the data. So if you're going to use uh, one of these uh, data models, uh, I think the onus is on you to work with a, a you know a vendor or if you're doing it yourself, uh, you know with the source data. Uh, to really do that uh, analysis of uh, the provenance of the data, the data sets, uh, how uh, well regarded are they? Are you know what were they trained with? Where have they been used previously? Are you safe in using them maybe in a different area? Uh, should you trial that uh, in some case? So I think uh, you know there, there's uh, um, onus on both sides in terms of the producers of the the, the uh, APIs and the data sets and then the consumers of them. But ultimately, the people who are using them. I think it's up. You know, to you, if you're, if you're basing your system on that, to know uh, what's in those models and to ask hard questions of the providers of the of the tools or the models to make sure that you're comfortable using them for the the uh, the application that you want to use them for. And I think that moves, yeah, you know, that goes from. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say I think that's uh, you know it really comes down to that that question of what data to use where and for what. And so it's all about, you know, knowing how close it is to a fact versus, uh, you know, a derived sort of data. And, and I was going to say that, you know, we have oftentimes, you know, the raw facts that are captured with big data. We do analysis, and so we're doing statistics and trend analysis. And, you know, there's that old thing about uh, statistics don't lie, but the people who are doing the statistical, statistical modeling can lie. And not really lie, but they can skew the statistics by by the kinds of analyses and algorithms that they're running against that. So I think you need to be aware of what kinds of processes have been run and what sort of preparation of the data. And then certainly, if it's a prediction that a system did on its own, uh, you want to understand you know the probability associated with that prediction and where that prediction you know uh, should be used uh, based on how, uh, how how solid that prediction is. And so I have this thing about particularly machine-generated data. I personally uh, want to have traceability back to both the supporting data that was used and the rationale. And I think a great example of this is IBM Watson had something they called the physician's assistant product. I think it's still out there. It was one of the first Watson products. Um, and so, you know, doing a diagnosis, uh, a physician could uh, work back to which data led the system to come to, to that diagnosis and what rationale, what sort of pattern or logic led them to it. And then they could decide whether they were comfortable with that diagnosis if they needed to do more research or whatever. So it's a, a, a case where the smart system augments a human and you've got that, uh, you know, the, com uh, the combination effect or the, um, the uh, sanity check that a human working with that data provides. And so that's the kind of thing I like. I get a little concerned when I see you know, deep learning systems that are recurrent neural network based, and you've got these layers and layers of, of data that have been, uh, that's been analyzed to create patterns. The patterns may not be 
very obvious, the rationale may not be explicit, and so you have to ask, you know, do you feel comfortable trusting that system? Uh, and for certain uses, that may be okay. For other uses, you may, you know, want to, to have the system be smart enough to be able to explain to you why it came to the conclusion it came to before you're willing to use that, that uh, data. Yep, and, and I see that, you know, the, the, the last item, the last bullet, the what data to use where um, and, and for what reason. I mean, the whole idea of augmenting um, machine-generated uh, machine-generated data from have, getting people involved in it before results are, are shown and before biases might come out, I think that's really important aspect of, you know, this is an additional or, or a an extension beyond the traditional uses of data to um, to do things that we, in, in a long time, we haven't even really been thinking about how we're going to use it. But now there are people that are thinking about it. Data science is something that's real and that organizations are starting to embrace. Data scientists is a very popular um, a popular uh, title or a popular role for that, that organizations are starting to embrace as they're starting to move towards chief data officers and things like that. The ways that we use data, the, the ways that we extend our uses of the data require that we have that traditional aspect of making sure that the data is well defined, that it's being produced in such a way that we can uh, we can track back to where the data is coming from and how we're using that data, making sure that you know what we we're not stepping on our own toes as we start to take some of this data and make it available. It's a fascinating world that we're living in, and, and that the extended uses of data in organizations and the different ways that they're looking to use it are certainly calling for um, for governance around that data. And I want to spend a couple minutes here talking about you know creating a framework around data governance, and then I'm going to turn it over to Shannon here in a minute to see if we have any questions from our participants. But typically, when I'm looking at putting a framework in place, and framework's a very popular term in a lot of industries, but putting a framework in place around data governance, you know, a lot of organizations are first focusing on, on developing best practice around governing that data, and that now needs to extend into all uses of the data beyond business intelligence, beyond big data and structured and unstructured data into the smart data and the smart data applications. Because I think that's, we're just really scratching the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how data can be used in organizations. So certainly, you know, everything that I've talked about in the past in regards to putting best practice in place around the governance of the data certainly extends to the, the smart data itself, certainly formalizing accountability for people in the organization who are defining, producing, and using that data and making sure that roles are well defined. Uh, again, so we don't step on our own, our own toes or get in our own ways of how to best utilize this type of data for the benefit of the organization. Certainly, we've got processes in place that we need to govern, and I always talk about the need to apply governance to the processes. So all of the processes that you talked about in regards to the collecting of the data and the understanding of the data and the metadata associated with that data, we need to apply governance in the same way to that data, uh, and we certainly need to execute and enforce authority because if we don't if we don't do that, the, uh, the the management of the smart data can certainly become unruly in organizations. Would you agree that, um, that 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 at least these are some of the items that we need to be considering, and maybe add to the list of other items that we should be considering when we're talking about putting a data governance framework in place to support uh, smart data initiatives within organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's definitely a very good list. And I, as I said, I think uh, early on, I think a lot of people in the data science community may be more uh, familiar with algorithms and statistics and, and that aspect and not necessarily with the management uh, of, of uh, data in, in more traditional enterprise settings. So I think it's an opportunity, you know, for those two camps to work together. Um, and I think, you know, most people want to do the right thing here, and I'm an optimist. I, I want to have access to all of the smart data for smart applications. I think there's a lot of benefits that can come from uh, smart applications, but I do think we have to be smart about, you know, the, the data itself and, and, uh, and, and how we're using it and making sure that we are managing and respecting people's privacy, security, 
uh, and that you know we know what data we have and what it can be used for and and uh, and what we're doing with it you know throughout its life uh, as well. So I think all the traditional things of data governance apply in this context. And if anything, we're just sort of expanding the set of uh, things that need now to be included in that. Yeah, you know, what I would take from that is that we really need to be smart about how we're putting data governance into place, especially for these new uses and these new applications of data in our organizations. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to turn it over to Shannon here in a second. And we talked about um, in this webinar, and I really appreciate your taking the time, Tony, to, to join us and to share information about smart data for people that, that may not have as much of a background in smart data as, uh, as we wish we would have as we're focusing on traditional uh, manners of, of data governance and organizations, provided us with the definition of smart data, why it's necessary to put governance in place around that. Um, well, I, the last thing that I want to mention is that, you know, just remind people about the webinar for next month being on do-it-yourself and purchase data governance tools. Now, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Shannon and see, Shannon, do we have any questions for Tony or for myself in regards to, um, in, to the information that we talked about today? Absolutely, and thank you, Bob and Tony, for this great presentation. Of course, one of the most common questions we always get are people inquiring about the um, slides and the recording. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by uh, within two business days, so by end of day Monday for this webinar, with links to the slides, recording, and anything else requested throughout the webinar. Uh, and let's get into the questions coming in. Uh, do you think? Data, I'll let uh, you guys decide who wants to answer this first. Um, do you think data governance should extend to checking uh, for bias, or is there a need um, uh, for governance around the analysis modeling process? You know what, I want to let Tony, yeah, I mean, Tony grab that yeah. one first. Yeah, I was going to say, since I raised the issue, I guess, uh, I think it's both. I mean, I think the earlier you can uh, uh, introduce data governance in the process, the better off you are. So as as people are creating uh, data sets that they uh, believe will be candidates for use in uh, in machine learning algorithms, um, and certainly you know there there are cases where people pick up existing data sets that weren't intended for that use, and so then I think that uh, means that at that point when you're now using something differently, you need to understand the ramifications of that. So, but the earlier in general you can introduce it in the process, the better. Uh, certainly, if if uh, we do see biases in models, I think there's a feedback loop uh, that uh, that we can introduce that says this model is good for this purpose, but not for that purpose, and or be be cautious when you're using it uh, outside of maybe the, uh, the the limitation that it was originally uh, uh, set for. And I mean, that can be things you know, that, like the Google example that I mentioned, or things that are more benign, like if you've produced a a, uh, a model that analyzes objects based on their shape because you want to put them in inventory uh, efficiently in a warehouse somewhere, that's different than, than maybe uh, looking at objects. Uh, and so maybe you would put a, a mattress and a table in the same inventory shelf. But maybe if you're uh, looking at for use in something like a, a, a purchasing system or recommendation of purchasing, that, that tells people something they might want to buy for their home, well, then function becomes important. So you want to analyze uh, data and use data sets that are more about the use of the object as opposed to its shape. So you really need to know sort of what information you're working with and what you intend to use it for uh, and, and make sure that you're matching things properly, I guess. Yeah, when we talk about you know framework for data governance associated with with smart data, certainly the roles and responsibilities, certainly all those things on a slide that we that I kind of just went through um, recently, you know, are things that are, are are we need to put in place. Certainly, the roles and responsibilities become very important. Um, you know, I would say that the I always focus on the the definition, the production, and the usage of data when we talk about making sure that biases. Are being are being made. Uh, people are being made of, aware of biases that are being injected into the results that are being shared with people in their organization. 
that there needs to be governance specifically around the usage of that data. And certainly the definition and the production of that data is very important, but you know, we certainly need to um, put governance in place around how smart data is being used. So we use it smart and we, and, and we uh, take care of protecting the data that needs to be protected and using data in the most appropriate way in the organization. So that, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. All right. Shannon, we got are there any additional questions? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we got lots of good questions coming. Can you ask that, um, oh, so uh, can you uh, repeat the name for the aspect that data scientists engage in not to, or in to not identify data sources, something like non-referential, non-identifiable? Oh, it's differential privacy. And there's a good paper, extremely technical, but a very interesting paper by uh, uh, Zachary Chase Lipton at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, on that subject, uh, and uh, so if you're into deep mathematics and understanding that sort of thing, uh, but, but there, it's also accessible even from a lay person in terms of just getting the sense that, that they are taking an algorithmic approach to introducing that noise or to uh, anonymizing data uh, in ways that I said, as I said, uh, preserve the, 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 uh, the real valid statistics in the data but make it much more difficult for people to kind of reverse engineer into, uh, into individualized uh, data. All right, and we've got another question coming in. Well, actually, we are right at the top of the hour. You know, if you do have additional questions, so we're actually out of time, I apologize. Um, one of the great things about this webinar is Bob will write up answers for you and get them to you, and we'll include those answers to any questions we didn't get a chance to get to, um, but with, within the follow-up email. So go ahead and keep submitting those questions, and we'll make sure and get answers to you. Again, just a reminder, I always send a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording of this session, again, along with anything else requested, like the additional uh, answers we didn't have time to get to. Bob and Tony, thank you so much. Tony, so great to chat with you again and hear from you again. Um, always such a pleasure, and thanks to all of our attendees who are so engaged in everything we do. We just really appreciate uh, the involvement and the questions that come in on the and your attendance. So I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.